What's up y'all, it's Shuffle, and today's video is going to be about traps in Darkest Dungeon, and I'm not talking about traps you run into in hallways, I'm talking about a type of thing that it looks good at first, so like an item or an ability, you look at it and you go, okay, that looks pretty good, and then in practice it actually isn't. They still have their upsides at times, of course, because anything in this game can be turned into a positive, even stuff like some of the diseases like the fits just because you get three speed sometimes you want three speed over other stuff so that's just what we're working with so for the i guess i should plug my stuff so obviously i stream on twitch four days a week join discord if you haven't if you consider supporting on patreon for the stuff you like then that is greatly appreciated there's also cool stuff to be had there but with um this here so i mean notes that no one can see haha -ha, and it's like Word document, so we're gonna start with the characters. And our first character is gonna be Abomination. So the first trap with Abomination is actually Transform. And the reason is because you see Transform and you think to yourself, oh, I'm gonna press this, and the scaling for the stress is just static, which is odd. I wish it was like, I don't know, start out like high and then went down or something like that, because why doesn't he get better at doing this? Who knows, these stats go up, but that's besides the point. With Transform, the reason it's kind of a trap, even though the stats are nice, is you get this stress on top of yourself and then the rest of your party while you're Transform, and it's like, why will you Transform when you can just press Manacles? Why would you do anything else besides spam this thing, especially if you can get Broken Key, which is one of the cheapest Endless Harvest Trinkets out there? Like, there's no reason to transform with this move in its current iteration with the trinkets you can get. There's just no reason. Like, the only time you transform is if stuff has gone wrong, so it's really just not worth doing. And on the subject of Abomination, actually, the other trap in this dude's kit is right here. Restraining Padlock. This thing, it's just not worth enough. Like, the minus 40% stress, I'm pretty sure when you transform, I'm, I think that goes down to 5 instead of 8, like that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. And that's 40% stress on the party, like that's just not that much. You're better off running Houndmaster or Jester to stress heal the party instead of using something like this. This is an entire trinket slot on someone that does not have great accuracy with their, uh, their attacks here. So rate goes up to 110, that's solid, but 105 on Rage? Rake has to charge up over a couple turns, and then Slam, I think, is in the same boat of 105. 100 on Slam. So Abomination, if you're going to transform, desperately needs accuracy. I'm not wasting a trinket on this, but... Like, I, like, I'm fine all day, and the moment I start having to record, there's cat hair. And my nose gets itchy, so... Who's our next trap? Arbalest. So there's a lot of trappery in Arbalest. Actually, is there a lot of trappery? Let's see. There's two. So the first is Bola. People will sit here and tell me, like, oh, it's good, though, because you can move, you know, some units and do stuff, and sometimes you move both of them. And it's like, you really don't move both of them. Arbalest has very low base damage, so you want her to hit mark targets to scale, because she can scale super hard. Sniper Shot does double damage, maxed out, I think. Yeah, so double damage with bonus crit. At level 5, that's a lot. That takes her from 7 to 14 up to, uh, yeah, 7 to 14. So, 14 to 28. So, if they're marked, she's doing leper damage. Actually, more than leper damage with massive crit. And her crit bonus, I gotta make sure that I remember my camera's in the bottom right here. But her crit bonus is damage against smart. So, stacking crit's very good on her. So, like, why why use Bola? I tried to power through the dog attack. I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, I saw you. Yeah, so Bola, the move chance is so abysmally low, and if you're curious why this 105 is really bad, a lot of enemies have around like 90 move resist, I think 65 even on like the low end for a lot of them, and you only have like a 40% chance, like at best in most situations to move something, and oftentimes it's lower than that. Why would you waste time pressing this move? I don't get it. So, Arbalest, that's her main ability trap. I think we all know Sniper's Mark is pretty lackluster overall, especially because it lasts two turns. Is, am, I, am I seeing this correctly? It's two rounds. <sighs> I don't get it. So much wrong here. 
Same with uh, suppressing fire. Come on, man. Anyway, so the other big trap with Arbalest is kind of a thing that happens with a lot of snipers, and this is more of a playstyle thing. People think, oh, I need to make her slow. Same with Vestal. It's like, oh, I need to make her slow because I need to make sure my mark gets set so I can shoot them and, you know, get my bonus damage. And that's not true at all. It's actually oftentimes uh, a tempo loss or sometimes even a damage loss by slowing down Arbalest. Like, Restring Crossbow is one thing because you get a lot of power on the back end of that, so I understand. But, like, if you... If you want to just make her as slow as possible, like, leave Slow Draw and... I guess Slow Draw is okay if you really wanted to do that, but I still wouldn't. And just making her slow serves very few purposes. The first is that the mark is going to wear off, or like the buff, or the debuff is going to wear off on their turn, and they go before Arbalest. So that's not helpful in the grand scheme of things. And if you do go before your setter, like the person who's putting down your mark, like Bounty Hunter or Houndmaster, you just shoot them anyway. That's extra damage. You just get half damage compared to what you would get, and that's good enough in most cases. Or sometimes you might want to heal or suppressing fire. There are a lot of things you can do if you happen to go before your mark character, then like making Arb slow and feeling like you wasted your time. If anything, don't make Arb slow. Make your mark setter faster. That is probably the better rule of thumb to go with. So that was Arbalest. Check here. Bounty Hunter, we were just talking about him. So, Bounty Hunter has one massive trap, and that's Wounding Helmet. So, this is very rare trinket here. You got 25% bonus melee damage, which is pretty good. Bounty Hunter does have some really high base damage, like 8 to 16. Well, I shouldn't say really high, but 8 to 16 is good. This takes him up to, since it's a, what, a quarter? That's 10 to 20, I think which is not bad, right? Not bad for damage. The problem is these two penalties. You lose 25% move skill, probably not the end of the world, and then you lose 20% stun chance. So Bounty Hunter as a character opens up quite a bit later on. I shouldn't say later on, but he opens up as a character when you start to understand that the stuns are his best moves. He has great damage if he's set up or you're against humans and it's just like, on demand but you don't need it for the first parts of the fight usually when you have bounty hunter teams you have other people who are doing damage too because you might have some more mark synergy or you can just run bounty hunter as a stun bot that's also very good and spending those first couple turns disrupting the enemy using flashbang to pull rank fours up to like rank two or something like that can be really good or even rank one so the back of the enemy party up to the front or uppercutting a rank two into rank four like they're gone if you uppercut something in the second spot of the enemy party all the way to the back you not only disrupt their back line a little bit but they're stunned in the back so they waste that turn being stunned and then the next turn they have to use like stumble scratch and then the turn after oftentimes they have to use stumble scratch again or maybe there are only a few enemies a few enemies that can do stuff out of rank three even though they are better in rank two or something like that so Bounty Hunter can really lock something down with just Uppercut or Flashbang, and that's fantastic. Like, why would you want to make this worse? That's why I was talking about the Wounding Helmet. So you get this damage that you get like two points of damage in most cases, unless I forget how it scales with Mark. I don't remember how it like comes into account first, but you get a little damage bonus at the cost of like your control kit. That is not worth. That is never worth in like, 99% of situations unless you have like slow draw slow reflexes bounty hunter with another bounty hunter that has a control setup that's the only time it might work and you can still use this trinket but honestly bounty hunter as a character is just better when he can do all of his disruption stuff between come hither the two stuns caltrops that's not quite disrupting but you know what I mean he has a lot of other stuff going for him before he starts chopping into things for big damage so I do not like Wounding Helmet for that reason. Flage. Not all characters have traps, so don't fret yourselves. Otherwise, this video would be like two hours. It's probably going to be like 25 minutes. Eternity's Collar. So this thing is a trap. Like, on paper, I thought it was pretty good at first, but honestly... 
I forget how his dodge works, like if he loses dodge at death's door, like it, this has been explained to me like three times, but my brain is not retaining it. And then you have bonus damage if you're above 85 stress, which means you're pretty much just rapturous at that point. And that's already dangerous enough that I don't want, like I don't need the bonus damage at that point. And the reason this thing isn't good is because you have two conditionals. So you have the bonus dodge at death's door, then you have the bonus damage during pretty much rapturous. You don't get both of these at the same time, usually. You can, but usually don't. And then you have like 10 death flow on top. So for 90% of your game, like 95% of your gameplay, this trinket is just 10 death flow. Why would you use that? The other reason, or like the comparison to it, is the fact that, if I can find it. I should went the other way, let me go back up. So it's the fact that Martyr Seal exists. Martyr Seal, all of the the bonuses on Martyr Seal are consolidated. You get the damage at Death Store, you get the crit at Death Store, you get the Death Blow Resist, which is more than the Collar, which helps you at Death Store. And you get 15% bonus HP on top of it, which means Flagellant gets more room to yo-yo his HP around, and he always has this. Eternity's Collar doesn't exist unless you are dying or rapturous. This thing, Martyr Seal, exists at all times at least in some capacity. And then all of its other bonuses synergize together at Death Store, so you know what you're getting out of this. That's why Martyr Seal is way better. Like, I would never run Collar if I can find a Martyr Seal. So that's why the Collar's a trap. The itemization's just kind of whack, uh, like just top to bottom, and Martyr Seal exists, and Martyr Seal just blows that thing away. Grave Robber, okay, let's drink some water here. <clears throat> So Grave Robber, this is interesting. It's actually Pick to the Face. Pick to the Face is a trap. So the reason is Pick to the Face has a damage penalty, much like Pierce, we were talking about this in Discord today. But Shield Breaker has huge damage. Like her base damage stat is quite big. It's like nine to 17 or nine to 18 or something like that. Grave Robber is chilling at seven to 14. So you're giving her the same minus 15% penalty on top of that. So this just isn't that good. Like the damage comes out to like five to 11 or something like that. It's not, it's not good. And you're thinking, okay, well it has armor piercing. The armor piercing's nice, but there's um, I, I don't, I haven't mapped this out yet, but up because of the damage penalty on top of pick to the face, lunge is actually more damage up to a certain point. It's probably like 33 or 40% prot. Lunge can still do the same or more damage. I think once you get past 50, I think that's when it starts to fall off. Sorry about that again. So yeah, Pick just isn't that good. The reason you, you run Pick is because it's her only move she can use in rank 1. If I had something else I can do in rank 1, like even Poison Darts, I would not run Pick to the face. Pick to the face just, it's not... Like, the damage is mediocre, even if you buff it up. Like, sure, it can crit for like 40, which I think Jabril was doing by using Shadow Fade and stuff. So like, I get that, but it's just, the damage isn't there. And if you need to get past armor, Poison Darts is just as good because, you know, like, it, it does damage over time, which isn't affected by armor. It has an okay on-hit damage at minus 60, and it's got better crit modifier and more accuracy. And it hits rank 1, so there's, there's a lot more advantage to Poison Darts, especially because you can stall with it, because you can just slowly kill the enemy and stun them and, you know, wear them down and plan out your turns and then heal accordingly. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But yeah, just because lunge and darts cover so many options, Pick to the Face is really a move you take out of necessity. Like, this this thing is not worth running 99% of the time. It's really just there because sometimes you lunge and you don't want to Shadow Fade that turn, so you just Pick to the Face. Or sometimes you get shuffled and you get thrown up to rank 1 with Grave Robber Safety's Pick to the Face. Or, heaven forbid, sometimes you, the rest of your party dies and you're stuck with Grave Robber in rank 1. There was actually a post, I believe, on Reddit where someone fought Sham Burrito and they lost their entire party and they didn't have Pick to the Face and there's one Clapper Claw. So make of that what you will. Okay. So we have Highwayman. Ooh, this is gonna be a good one. So Highwayman is point blank, actually. The damage mod is great on point blank. Don't get me wrong. The knockback is solid. 
Again, Bolas sucks because it has bad knockback. This has much better knockback. It has an okay crit modifier, 9% on top of, what's higher man, like 10% base? 9% base, right here? So that's pretty good. The issue with this move is two things. One, you have to be in rank one, which means you don't get to use pistol shot and duelist advance, which are both very good moves you don't have up at all times. Some, sometimes you duelist into rank one, so I understand that, but there are a lot of times where pistol shot's really good. The other is the fact that you have all of this huge, awesome damage, usually going into some enemy that has like 40 prot or 33 prot. So the the damage that comes out of this move isn't as much as you would think and it's to the point where if you, if you know the history of Highwayman like before he got buffed and stuff like that or even after he got buffed to where Duelist did repost there are a lot of people that start Highwayman in rank 1 to open with point blank when I do my Highwayman guide I'm gonna address this like in depth but it's that it's not that good of a strategy and what I think is actually pretty funny is that over time, the starting position of Highwayman has actually gotten further and further into the back of the party. So there are a lot of times where he was being started in rank 1, so you use point blank and open with that and get, you know, the big damage. But then everyone's like, well, Duelist is pretty crazy, and you get the repost and stuff, so let me put him in rank 2 so I can Duelist into rank 1, get my repost going, and then point blank the frontliner and get a bunch of damage there. But then people start thinking... Well, those backliners are more important than those frontliners in a lot of cases. There are some exceptions, like Crimson Court, for instance, a lot of strong enemies are up front that you can point blank, like Mosquitoes. You can get rid of those with one point blank usually, and that's pretty nice. So, the the like the evolution of thought was, okay, we're going to go from starting from one to starting him in two. And now Highwayman is being commonly started in, no joke, like rank four or rank three. And the reason is because if you start in rank 4 you can duelist into rank 3 so you're like you know in the back line of the party still and from there you can still use open vein you can use pistol shot you can use wicked slice you have so many options from that spot on the field that you can duelist up there you're chilling you do your pistol shot into rank 4 or something like that usually and help kill that thing and then the turn after then you duelist again, because your repost is about to fall off. So you duelist back into rank 2, and then you still have those options as need be. If you foresee yourself needing point blank by turn 4, then you can start Highwayman in uh, spot 3. But that's just the evolution of Highwayman himself. It went from, let me start with point blank, to let me put him in the back of my party with duelist advance. Just because opening with this is so weak compared to the action economy of this, and then the flexibility that follows up afterwards. So because of that, point blank, for all of the good upside stats, is kind of a trap. It's still okay to have on because sometimes you get, you know, surprised at full light, Highwayman gets thrown up to rank 1 so he needs a way out of there. And usually running Wicked Slice and Open Vein together is not advised, so point blank is still kind of there out of necessity unless you really want like Grape Shot or Tracking, and there are cases for those. But for the most part, point blank is just kind of falling off. It's more of like a I need to move type of thing or give shield breaker, you know, another adders really quick or a second impale without making her do pierce afterwards. And that's really what point blank is there for now. It's mostly the movement, the damage and the knockback and stuff is honestly secondary. Especially the knockback one. That's it's kind of weak in a lot of cases. The only time the knockback one's really good is like you puncture rank four up into rank two and then point blank um afterwards but like puncture moves you up one so you have to start shield breaker like in some weird spot like rank three i don't know but i've talked about highway man quite enough jester can you guess what it is for jester it's not it's not finale it is bright tambourine so bright tambourine is interesting because you know you see this plus 20 percent stress skills and you're like, okay, that's that's fantastic in a lot of cases. And it's still pretty solid for his camping. But for Inspiring Tune at max level, I think it comes out to like, no joke, plus two. Just because of how it rounds, I'm pretty sure it goes from 12 to 14 stress heal. And that's not really anything. Like if you do this, you know, if you're healing uh, 12 at a time, you'd have to heal, what is that, six times to get the benefit of one free skill. That's way too slow for a skill use. Like... The reason you can justify revenge, 
for Leper is because you get your damage back after three hits, and that's fine. That's not a huge tempo loss. Grave Robber, you can justify Shadow Fade because she gets her damage back the next turn. Like, you know, for the most part, it's very close mathematically. But with Inspiring Tune, it takes so long to get this value back from giving up your Trinket slot, and there are a lot of other things you can just put on. I went from running this all the time to never putting it on, and I haven't really noticed a change in the gameplay. The other thing you may be saying to yourself is, well, you get this minus 25% stress fear and high torch, and that is pretty good. That's a that's a big number. Like that's an aria box on top of a stress healing thing, and that's pretty good. But you really don't need it because you have the best single target stress healer in the game who's also got a lot of evasion. So he usually isn't getting hammered that bad by stress. The only time he really gets hammered by stress is if you finale very aggressively and there's like a cultist switch in the back that just starts bombing you. So otherwise, usually Jester, if you're not playing like Endless Harvest, his stress is pretty manageable. So you really don't need the Bright Tambourine, which is why it's a trap. I think I put it too high in my tier list too. Like I, I should have put this like C tier. Just because it, it's so much lost value, or like the value is so little compared to other things you could be running. Like I would rather run critical dice, because the times I do attack stuff, then maybe I can, you know, get that crit and hit it for big damage. Even lucky dice to get four dodge on top, or dodge trinket, or ancestor's map. There's just a lot of things you could be running. But instead you're giving yourself a trinket that half the time you dodge the attack that stresses you anyway. And the other part of it is you get plus two stress healing. Like if you think about Bright Tambourine as I'm giving myself plus two to my stress heal, not that good. It's really not. You can justify like Ancestor Scroll for Crusader because it doubles up. Because that thing double dips on the HP heal and the stress heal, which makes it a lot better. And Crusader can also stress heal himself in camp, which is pretty nice. Man at Arms. Leper has been spared the wrath. It's Bolster. So Bolster, it's actually, Bolster's a good move. Oops, bought my desk. Don't get me wrong, Bolster got nerfed into the ground, but it's still solid. But the issue with Bolster now is most people think it's, like they'll put it on for hallway and room battles, and this is not a regular fight move. This move, like Bolster is too slow to get value in hallway and room battles. It's fine in Endless Harvest, and it's really good on bosses, but if you don't have like a dodge team set up, the bolster, you know, dodge bonus and tactics, like all that, it helps, but usually you want some kind of dedicated dodge team. And the minus stress is nice, but like I said, it's too slow. Man at Arms, his hardest turn is turn one, because he has so many things he wants to do. He can rampart, he can actually crush into rank three and get some good damage there. Bellow sets up his next turn, like, amazingly. Sometimes you might you might want a defender, sometimes you want a command. Retribution, like he has six other buttons that are actually great on turn one. And then you have this. And all these buttons that are great on turn one are also great on turns two and three, and the fight's usually decided at that point, and you don't need bolster. So bolster is a trap unless you're doing a boss mission. SB. You know, I wrote this, and I don't... I don't quite know... <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at Occultus and I was like, should I put Roof Spaghetti as a trap? And then I thought back to Thick, and I think he said Abyssal Artillery, my beloved. And that was just funny to me. So, I want to call Incision a trap, but it's not. Incision's good. Um, Shield Breaker. Expose. The issue with Expose is there are only like two times in the game you need it. It's on Shield Breaker's Nightmares and veteran warrants when you fight the three hook pigs that can go into stealth. Those are the times specifically when you need expose. The weakness in expose is the fact it can't hit rank four. That is honestly a travesty. I wish, I wish, I wish on a fish that this could hit rank four. It's okay for the movement, but shield is another character where it's like, you would rather hit something like adders or you know, Puncture, Pierce, Adders, these are all better moves than Expose. Impale's good late game, Captivate's actually some pretty good damage. Overall, I want to do some tests with Shieldbreaker to see like how much, or like how good the, the Captivate spam is, because it might be great. The issue with Captivate's it's targeting, but that's something else entirely. Yeah, so Expose doesn't, like, it just doesn't do enough. Like the damage penalty is pretty strong, the crit bonus is not bad, it's not that high though. 
it does give minus speed, so that is something I can give to this. Like, the crits received is nice, but the minus speed, this is actually pretty sick. It's just the fact that, like, in a lot of cases, you're looking at this for the debuff and not the stealth removal. So, especially at the 110 accuracy, like, you don't need this outside of, like I said, a couple scenarios, which are snakes and veteran warrens. Cruising right along here. Okay. Are we done after this? I think I'm just talking about the characters, right? Because the biggest choice you make is with your characters. It's not the the enemies in a lot of cases. So Vestal, I've talked about this one a lot, so people probably know what it is. And it's Sacred Scroll. Sacred Scroll is a freaking trap. The reason is this thing. It's it's the same reason that Bounty Hunter's Wounding Helmet is a trap because it locks you out of like the rest of your kit and you're just stuck doing like one thing. For Bounty Hunter, it's using his axe attacks. For Vestal, if you have a Sacred Scroll, you lose your ability to stun for the most part and then you lose your bonus damage on Zap. So that's, that's Judgment. The only time that Sacred Scroll is really good is if you're in a certain boss fight or there are a few boss fights like this, where you're going, okay, I just need raw healing output. That's when this thing is good, and that's the only time it's good, is if you need raw healing output. But Vestal, as a character, gets a lot better if she can throw out her stuns on occasion, snipe rank four with Judgment, contribute with damage in that way, because Judgment hits for a decent amount. It's got a, it's got a small penalty on top of it, which is what? It's 33%, I think? 25, that's it? It's only minus 25, yo. That's pretty good, right? That takes her down to like, what, five, like five to 11, five to 12 damage? That's not bad. That's not bad at all. And then you stick this thing on top of it, the minus 33% damage. So that's what, minus 58%, which that's over half. That takes you down to like three to seven? Three to seven or three to six on judgment at max rank. That's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. Like, I don't want that. I don't want three to six damage. <laughs> I'd rather have five to 12 if I had a choice. So with Sacred Scroll, it is a trap that I, I constantly try and tell new players about. Like if I get Sacred Scroll early, I will still use it. Um, there are some boss fights where I still bust it out because it is nice to have the extra healing bump because it can be good in those situations. But if you've been looking at my guide videos specifically, I just use Salacious Diary every time now because this is just 25% healing with no downside. And I would rather have the 8% difference here from the healing and not deal with the the minus stun and the minus damage. The minus stress is okay. That's not bad. That kind of that makes things like Sacred Scroll Junior's head, which is I'm sure most of you know what that trinket is. It's the other healing one. That's um I'll just search it. Yeah. So, you know, you shave this down to plus 10% stress and you get plus 63% healing. That's actually really good. But like I said, you don't need raw healing output Vestal that often. And Thick was talking to me about this the other day and he was saying that Vestal's healing, like it starts off pretty bad and then it scales by level five. It scales into a, a territory of how much it can recover where you almost don't need a healing trinket anymore. Like you won't really miss it because her Heals are solid enough at max level. Let's see. See, so yeah, eight to nine, that's okay. And then was this four to five on divine comfort? That's that's honestly fine. Like divine comfort starts blowing this away in terms of efficiency at that point, and you don't really need the healing thing on top of it. But it it's still nice to have. I do still run healing trinkets a lot of the time just because it's it's safe. So I understand that. But overall. Sacred Scroll is, in fact, a freaking trap. You lose too much, you don't gain that much, and bonus healing is something provided by a lot of trinkets. You have Tome of Holy Healing, you have Junius Head, you have Chirogen's Charm, you have Salacious Diary, you have Ancestor Scroll. There are probably a couple others out there that I forgot immediately. You have Heretical Passage. There are a lot of things that give you bonus healing, and the only way you can get your bonus stun chance back is to use a trinket and 
Vestal's base stun chance is not that high. She's pretty good at stunning rank 3, so like Cultist Witch, she can bully with uh, the 140. But, you know, that's only average against frontliners who have like 95 stun resist. That's only a 55, no, 45% chance at that point. And you don't want to make that any worse. Even though it's only 10%, <clears throat> like a 10% reduction here, I feel like once I have this on, I just never stun anything. I mean, that's anecdotal, of course, but I feel like I just don't stun anything after that. And the other thing I'm going to talk about with Vestal, because she's how I'm going to wrap up this video, is it's the same thing as I was saying with Mark characters, where you don't want slow snipers to exploit Mark. You want everyone to be as fast as possible. The same is with Vestal. I do not believe in making Vestal slower, and I do not advocate for tanking her speed in order to get heals on targets, you know, that turn. You want Vestal to still be fast. At least, you want her speed to be at least the baseline, but it would be nice to get her a bit higher, so like, you know, plus two or plus three, depending on, like, trinkets and stuff. Like, Ancestor Pistol is pretty good on her. With Vestal being faster, instead of having to wait to heal someone on turn one, you can just open with stun. You can stun a vulnerable enemy because you're still fast enough to do so and prevent the damage instead of taking it, which is something I talked about in my action economy video. If you haven't watched it, you probably should, because I talk about Vestal specifically. And being able to stun something at the start of the fight and slow it down, you have a lot of control and a lot of tempo at that point. Or if you don't want to hit it with an opening stun, you can hit it with an opening judgment in like rank four and help Hellion for instance, clean something up with Iron Swan, that's pretty nice, or just chip it on damage somewhere else. So, don't make your Vestal slower. If anything, make her faster. This goes for all healers. If you want to think of it like, well, if I make them slower, I know who to heal, you can heal them at the start of the next turn. It's fine. You actually still have positive action economy at that point. Okay. I think that's it for this one. So, thanks everyone for watching. Next up, um, Leopard Guide is in the works. I need to edit it. I'm doing the, like, I'm still working out the sponsor thing and the, um, what is it, the, the Game Dev World Championships stuff, like, the, they're, I think they're in Norway or something, so, like, they're asleep every time I email them, and then they email me back when I'm asleep, so it's, it's pretty slow going there, but yeah, that's the stuff coming up, and as always, you know, Torchless VODs, um, Butcher Circus VODs, when we're done with that stream, they'll start coming up, and yeah, I'll stop talking, so thanks for watching. Next time, stuff, join Discord, Twitch, Patreon, all that garbage, and I will see you later.